Is it pointed over there? I don't, yeah, I don't know, I, uh, hold on. I don't think, it was working before, but I don't think it's, uh, because I have it set to, like, Like I got display settings hooked up, and it's like it saw it before, and it had more resolution options. Yeah, that's what I did. Or F seven. No, that's not. I don't think that's it. Okay. I think it's the projector, right? What, what is what is this HDMI? What? Yeah. No, I I think it's just that the monitor is not like like I switched it to mirror mode. How do you do that? Was it control? No, I gotta hit function. What's that? What's uh? How do you switch back? What is it? F seven? I thought it was seven or one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I, oh, shoot. I don't know what's going on. Okay, I'm going to reboot this thing. <laughs> now my screen's all messed up. Oh, what's going on? Try it. I gotta, hold on, let me log in oh, and yes. just reboot. That's odd. Don't look at my password. <laughs> Kevin. Oh, I know why it's flashing. Well, I think I know why it's flashing. I think it was because I, I had to hit the function key. And like I must have just hit some function key that messed up something else.
Where does that HDMI cable go into? This thing? Try rebooting, but I don't think that's, <laughs> that's going to fit. Let's try rebooting with the, with the Wallet Plus One, and maybe it will send the voice over. Okay. Not looking good. I think I think it's the either the projector or the that stuff. Oh, the green light's going. does the update install thing when you reboot. <laughs> Kevin, you got your laptop on you? I don't want to just plug it into this cable to see, like... I have a... Uh, is that USB-C on this side? Yeah, it is. So I have a little... Adapter? We can try uh, that. You want to try it real fast? Yeah, just plug it. I'll plug it. Plug it in. I think I grabbed my adapter there. Oh, that's right. I USB. forgot. Well, we might have to wait for it to, uh, might have to wait for it to read. I didn't, I told it, I, yeah, I forgot to check the box or something. And th this might not work until that's done. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh, go. perfect. I will remove this. All right, you're back online. Just Nah, the HDMI thing on this was like, oh man, what's this? Uh
There we go. That's okay, I think. <laughs> this is rebooting again. Hey, Kevin, you got that adapter? Thank you.
So I've determined that this projector does not support HD resolution. And I don't think I can get it into mirror mode, but we're going to give that one more shot. All right, maybe that works. Now, hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> My name is uh, Perry Gagney. And uh, I work at Red Hat. I work in the network services team, which is basically mostly like kernel tool, like kernel slash user land tools for networking. Uh, so some people that I don't work on this stuff, but people in my team typically work on like network manager, NIC driver stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I work on is something called the LNST framework which is a framework that is used to do performance testing of uh, networking. networking stuff. Specifically, well, it's, 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 it's not infrastructure. It's because I come from the infrastructure world, and this is like a difference for me, right? It, uh, it's used to mostly do performance testing of the networking bits within the kernel. And its primary goal is for CI testing. So when we do a build of kernel or open vSwitch or a few other packages, uh, we want to know, like, hey, the changes here, did they affect the performance at all? Did they make it, like, did it cause, like, a, a big change in performance of stuff? Um, so we use LNST to do that. Um, and it's run as part of our CI pipeline. When so when some kernel developer goes and gets a build, it you know it sends a message out to a message bus, and eventually it triggers a build of LNST that goes and runs a set of tests. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna go into detail about like what tests and whatnot, um, but maybe we'll get into that as we get into like things. Um, so like I said, it's run as typically part of kernel slash open vSwitch builds. Um, it's a Python 3 framework uh, with Python 3 recipes, which maybe I'll get into this later why that's important. But basically, long story short, um, there was an older version of LNST that was developed before I was on the team that used Python 2 and then Python 3, but it used XML recipes. And we'll get into what a recipe is uh, later. Um, and so typically when you do an LNST run, you basically, you, you, you want to get a pass or fail, right? Did the test pass, did the test fail? And the pass and fail is based on whether or not the measured um, performance metrics that are measured as part of the recipe fall within established thresholds. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so typically what we measure is CPU usage and network throughput. And for CPU usage, we, uh, we read from like, there's some stuff that we read from like proc and stuff. And I also think we, and then for throughput we get, uh, we use iperf. So essentially at the end of the day, LNSC is somewhat a, kind of a fancy wrapper around iperf. Um, and we also use another tool called Neeper. We used to use uh, NetPerf back in the day, and NetPerf had s stuff for both stream testing and uh, what's called like request receive testing. And we switched to using iPerf for most of our stream testing, but there wasn't a request receive feature. And so we were trying to find another one. Um, and we ended up going with Neeper. And fun story behind that, the reason we, one of the reasons we switched to NetPerf it has to do with uh, NetPerf, although it was open source, was not explicitly, like their license wasn't explicitly like, I think GPL3 compatible. 
So as because we work at Red Hat, they were kind of concerned about potential stuff. Well, so I did all this work to add the support for this Neeper tool, which is developed by, I think, Google. And uh, once that project was done, uh, HP finally fully open source NetPerf. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, and we, we made a few custom changes to iPerf um, 3 to support something called MPTCP, which is multi-path TCP. Um, those changes are were submitted as a pull request upstream. I don't know. I didn't make those changes. Somebody else on the, like, in the, the guy working on MPTCP did, basically. Uh, I don't know if they've been merged yet. In fact, actually, I was thinking about this while I was writing this. I'm like, I should check on that. Uh, so the way LNSC typically works is it w uses what's called a controller agent architecture, or it, we just call it, it, you have a controller and an agent. And what that means is you have this controller machine here that's running uh, an instance of the code, and it talks to uh, one or more uh, sort of a what are called agent machines. Um, and those agent machines ha in our sort of uh, test lab setup, those agent machines have a variety of different NICs installed that have various, that support various drivers that we want to target. Uh, IXGB, I40E, just, there's a bunch of just ones that we have and we've come up with like a list of here are the drivers that we want to use for our testing. Um, and so we have NICs that would support those drivers. Um, so the typically we just have two agents running. Um, and typically they're just connected either back to back or through a switch with like, depending depending on what protocol we want to test with, this, this might get a little complicated. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we don't have a way yet of we haven't got to automatically configuring the switch to support stuff like VLANs. So when you have when you're trying to test something with VLANs, we we end up configuring just uh, Q and Q, so that the VLANs kind of get passed back and forth. But then when it gets when we get into wanting to test stuff with like lag and LACP, it gets a little weird. <laughs> so, um, so. Uh, we use virtual machines for uh, like you know testing. We don't. So LNST doesn't typically use doesn't do perform. We don't typically do performance testing for virtual NIC stuff. Um, although actually I say that and now I'm trying to remember if we do. Uh, but typically when we run it, like if I'm just developing for it, I, I need to run it. I'll, and what I'll probably do for this demo is I'll just run two Linux virtual machines with like a virtual, uh, little virtual switch. But uh, yeah, the actual like hardware isn't that important, but yeah, typically it, it's important when it comes to measuring the performance results. So yes, we typically use, we run it on hardware. We've started actually getting it to work, getting LNST to work in containers, which is like a whole thing. I don't know what, what the use case, we, the, one of the use cases for that is just to make it easier to do development against it. And I think maybe in the future that we might have use cases for using that in like OpenShift and stuff. I don't know. Um, and the way these things talk to each other, so the way the controller, uh, actually, so one thing to note, typically in our CI setup, the controller is typically actually just run on one of those agent machines. It's just a separate instance of the of the code. So you know when it, we actually run this in CI, it's it, there's only two machines. And we just run the controller on one of the two test machines. And um, the way that everything talks to each other is through a custom RPC protocol. Now, I've worked on many different test frameworks before. And this is the first one that has its own RPC protocol. And I have to say, it's quite nice. Because before, I would work on frameworks that would just basically, you would have it running on your machine or a server, and it would SSH to these machines and you know perform command line stuff and that's cause that, that kind of creates this like level of indirection when you want to like use certain libraries to like query stuff but the way this works is that we just have this agent software 
running and we have an RPC connection. It's a custom RPC connection that basically, <laughs> the way I didn't write it, somebody else did. Um, and the way I kind of think of it is that it takes a bunch of classes that were in, it, it, although it runs the same code base, there might be cases where you're like changing classes locally for development. And so to get around that, what it does is it pickles a bunch of class definitions and sends them to the agent so that instead of running the ones that are installed locally on those machines, it will just run those ones in case you've made changes to them and you want to test it. Um, but yeah, the RPC protocol, uh, besides that, it sends messages back and forth. It just pickles. Um, does anybody know what pickling is when I say that? OK, so Python has this, um, uh, it, it's, it's basically Python's way of serial. It is, it's a built-in serialization mechanism in Python. So you can take a Python object, and you can pickle it, and it will put it in a binary format and let you use it for saving it to file, sending it over a network, and then on the other end, you unpickle it. Uh, it's not like a, you know, it's not like JSON or anything. It's got its limitations, but it works well for stuff like this, and actually, we'll see another use case for it that's somewhat newer to LNST. Um, so, we do network stuff, which means we need to do network configuration. Now, on previous, uh, frameworks that I worked on, that was typically done by just shelling out to CLI tools or uploading config files and saving them, stuff like that. But what LNST does is it uses Netlink directly. Now, if anybody doesn't know what Netlink is, which I'm sure is some people, uh, it's, it's basically, it's a protocol, there's a Wikipedia page here, you can go look it up, but it's a protocol that is used for network configuration and sort of it's a, it's a, it's actually like a, from my understanding, it's like a socket protocol. It's like you have a Netlink socket and you read and write messages off the Netlink socket. And so you can use it for configuration and also like getting statistics and whatnot about Netlink. Under the covers is what the IP tool uses. So IP is basically like talking Netlink to get a lot of the information it does. Um, all of our network configuration uh, is done um, it's, it's all non, we don't want to persist it, so we don't typically do anything with Network Manager. In fact, we actually turn Network Manager off just so it doesn't cause any problems. Usually it, it doesn't, just in our use case, because LNSD itself is doing the config, we just tell Network Manager not to configure those interfaces. Um, so yeah. And then some other stuff that we do, we typically will either use, if there's like a, a C library or a Python wrapping for a library, I think there's like for ETH tool we do this. Um, sometimes we need to get ETH tool, use ETH tool. I think ETH tool has a C and Python library that we use. And anything else we can just, sh if, if, there's nothing, if there's nothing else, we can just shell out. What I mean by shell out is we you use Python to like run a command on the command line and then get the output and, and then process it. Um, so after LNST does a run, it will save uh, its results as what's called an LRC file. Um, and what it basically is is just uh, when you do a run, it creates this recipe. There's a recipe run object that gets created. And um, that recipe run object, this is just like a Python object, gets uh, pickled and compressed and then just written to a file. And I say this, it, previously what we did here was we, um, we just saved the log of the run, and then when we wanted to analyze the run later, we would just go parse the log, which was kind of a pain in the butt and didn't scale well, especially when you're dealing with multiple runs for, a lot of times when we have to gather statistics, we end up having to deal in like tens of runs of LNST, and we get all these runs and we, we pull them all together, and it just gets really messy. And with this, what we do is we just save it as an LRC file that can then get re-imported later, unpickled, and then reloaded back as a Python object, and then we can query it. This was kind of a pain in the butt to get going, but once we got going, it was really useful. The big pain in the butt is that sometimes when you're trying to pickle something, uh, when you're trying to serialize it, not everything can be serialized. So for example, all, that, all those C library calls and like, sockets that get open as part of stuff, 
that can't, <laughs> you can't. So then you have to go in and pickle lets you basically exclude certain fields of an object to, from being pickled. And so a lot of the work to get this to work was just going through and figuring out what we can't pickle, what was causing an error. And unfortunately, pickle is not very good at like telling you, it's like, oh, I wasn't able to pickle this object. I was like, okay, cool, like which variable of the object? Oh, I can't tell you that, man. So it was a little, a little touch and go. And uh, so the main data that's in the recipe run object, besides a whole host of other things, is the stats that were collected during the, perform the iperf run and like the CPU data and all that stuff. All right, so we got some demos I was gonna try to do. Um, unfortunately, when I was running, I was practicing this before, I ran into some issues with the demo. So let's see how far we get. And then, all right, let's see here. What is CI? Uh, continuous integration. So basically what that means is that um, whenever, Whenever people have some changes to the code base, say the kernel, right? They, get, they put their changes in and then they commit it and they push it to a branch. Um, you know, their own, let's say that they just push it to their own personal like branch and they want to do a merge request, right? So as part of the uh, merge request, they, uh, they want to run a bunch of tests on it. That's, and then so, CI stands for continuous integration, so it's basically you doing this a lot. Um, and so, and so, yeah, this is just one of many things that gets run as part of a kernel build. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right, cool. Probably should have started with just showing you the code of LNST. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this, uh, this, uh, This is going to be bad or good. It's going to be bad. Man, I wish I can get more. Like, did anybody else have like this bad resolution when they were doing their presentation? Um. Yeah. All right. So this is kind of a runner script for LNST. Um. So let's uh, let's see. Where do I want to start here? So this is actually. Let me just. So this is LNST. Um, we got our LNST. We got our agent code, common stuff, controller code, devices. So we have like representations of all these different network things, right? OBS bridges and uh, team devices. And team team is like kind of like a, it's like a new version of Bond, which is, as a, as a network guy, I think of it as just, that's just how Linux does lag, but it actually does more than just lag. Um, VLAN devices, stuff like that. Uh, let's see here, and these are our recipes. So let's look at a recipe. Let's look at, do we have, where's the example recipe? All right, so we have a recipe, and the way the recipe usually works is it will define two host requirements for those two agent machines, right? And uh, this is basically how we can specify what, uh, this is ba this actually doesn't give you a lot of device requirements, but a lot of times here you'll have things for like what drivers you wanna use sometimes, or it will give a list of acceptable drivers. Typically we don't use this, but in some, depending on what protocols we're trying to test, there might be specific requirements. And I think at some point we might expand this to also be useful for uh, trying to auto configure the switches to support uh, whatever protocols we need. Um, so um, the first thing we need to do is configure the devices so we can like send network traffic between them. and. Uh, 
Oh yeah. So this is actually like when you create these objects here, it 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 uh, this is how it like you know it specifies the requirements, but then what it does is it goes and runs a matching algorithm against a configured uh, set of configured uh, servers, and it basically matches to say, oh, I need these two things. Okay, here's a server that has it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a long, drawn-out process. Maybe I'll talk about it at the end. It's one of the demos I was thinking about doing. Um, yeah, it's this, this sets up what your host and your, your network interfaces are. It just specifies them. And then down here, once it's been matched, these objects are within what you use to reference those interfaces to configure them or get information about them or specify them and stuff. So, okay, so we go in, add an IP address, configure this IP address, configure that IP address. And then this recipe just actually runs just a simple ping job. It'll just ping between the two interfaces. So, yeah, so we say run ping, uh, which is, we have this job infrastructure, and that's why this isn't a, an object here. This is like a ping job object. It says ping from this interface to that interface. And then that's all it needs to know, because then it, it kind of just goes and gets all the info that it needs to ping, like what IP address, what's the primary IP, like the, the IP address on that interface and stuff like that. Um, and then, no, oh, this one actually runs NetPerf. Oh, this must be an old one. Um, yeah, we don't really uh, do NetPerf anymore. This must be an old one. I thought we had updated this, interesting. Um, yeah, so this will then, so okay, so we do a simple ping. So typically a lot of our recipes start with a simple ping just to confirm that everything's up and running. And then uh, then they can go and like configure stuff. Like they can go and say, oh, create a bond device uh, on top of the device, uh, run a command, destroy the bond device, create a bridge device. And you know, all this stuff is used in, you know, in, in other recipes. We don't typically like create like a team device and a bond device and a bunch of stuff in one recipe. It's it's typically just a recipe will go and create like oh it wants to test team devices so it will go and create some team devices and run the um, performance test on the team devices. And that's how we know like if somebody makes a change in the team device code or the drivers or something we can monitor and see like oh hey this um, this code change made team devices way less efficient. And then um, when we want to actually go and run the recipe, we use the we create a controller object, and then we instantiate the recipe. Um, and the recipe will sometimes have a bunch of parameters. We'll get in, we'll look at that maybe in a second. And then we run it. Um, this allow virtual thing is actually just used for um, if we're running on virtual machines. Instead of having the network interfaces pre-configured, we have it set up so you can just, it will just create them for you. So it will add a NIC to the VM and then bridge it however it needs to be bridged. Sometimes we run into problems, I run into problems with that. So I actually just don't use that sometimes. I just add them myself and bridge them myself and go on from there. Uh, and then it just prints uh, out a summary of the run. So let's see, uh, let's let's do a run actually. Let's actually run a recipe. Oh shoot, I have to boot up those VMs. Ah <laughs> uh, no. I guess it's better because I had all this stuff all set up and run. But now I have to go back and like, I had everything set up so that like all the, it, like I wouldn't even have to do anything, but then now it's like, okay, it's actually kind of good because I can go through it again. Does anybody have any questions while I'm getting this going? Uh, yes, it will be. I, I yes. I I think what I might do is run it with PyCharm. So PyCharm is what I had up before. It's a Python IDE. But yeah, these will just run. 
These will just run as, these are just Python scripts. They'll just run Python scripts. Yeah. Uh, there was something I was gonna show you. We, we do have a bunch of tools that will like generate graphs and stuff. So I was gonna try to show that, um, but I don't think that's gonna work because there were some issues with the tool and then finally somebody came along and, and fixed them. <laughs> Unfortunately, and then it was like, oh, hey, we fixed all that so you'll be able to do that. I'm like, cool. Yeah, we haven't merged it yet. You're just gonna have to use the guy's private branch. I'm like, all right. And I tried to get it to work and it's not working. I don't know why. <laughs> Like yeah, I've got, like I know why it's working, but I was like trying to figure out why I can't. It, yeah, so it's never run, uh, never rely on like some dude's private branch that hasn't been merged yet. That's the. To do what? Oh, to run LNST? No, we uh, no, we we typically will. We yeah, have it's it's when you do a kernel build, it's like. <laughs> We typically have like Jenkins instances local, like so this stuff, we have like there's like an LNST Jenkins instance that runs a lot of this stuff and that Jenkins run gets triggered from a, U, a message bus. And so when, and that message bus is written to by our internal build system for kernels called Brew, which is kind of based on Koji. Anybody know what Koji is? What's that? Um, oh, for the thresholds, um, we, we basically do a bunch of test runs and we, we collect, we basically do like, and this is why I was talking about why LRC files are nice, is we basically will do a bunch of test runs of LNST and collect the stats and on a bunch of like known good stuff and we'll look and see like, okay, this is like a known good build of RHEL. Typically, uh, and, and we'll, we'll have like different benchmarks for like, you know, rel eight, nine, and it, it's, it's based on what are called test configurations. Uh, maybe I can show that too. Um, and so we'll just do a bunch of runs, collect the stats, run some ana like statistics and analysis, and say, okay, we've calculated that the threshold should be 3%. So if we get a measured uh, an iperf run and it measures, you know, some, some amount of throughput and it's not within 3% of our known good value, then it will fail. And the, so there's, yeah, so that's the, the, the threshold is the 3% and then the actual, like, when it did a run and it say when we did that onboard run, we call it onboarding. When we do an onboard run and it saves it, it saves it to like some internal database with all the statistics that we captured. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we, yeah, we like to do that. You don't always have to. I mean, it's like, it depends. It's, it's kind of like, but, you know, because if we don't, but if we don't, then we'll start seeing a whole bunch of whole failures, right? So we have to make, we have to figure out like, uh, we have to re-onboard it, but yeah, we, yeah. Uh, so the, the test lab, like the test lab has like, I don't know, like 50 or more servers. I don't even know. I don't wor work with it much, but uh, typically they're all, uh, so yeah, so like each test, like whenever we do a CI run, we'll grab a couple of the servers. For the most part, they're the same. Um, for the most part, they're the same. We have a couple of different pools of them, right? We'll have some Intel, some AMD, some... And we have like ways of like, you know, we, we have ways of like figuring out like, okay, like if you see, we don't, we don't, we, we try to like manage the, we try to manage the data so that like the, you know, if there is an issue that is a result of like a machine difference, we're able to like view that. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, so we, we, we try to have the same style machines in the same NICs but due to procurement, right, that's not always possible, right? 
you can't like you can't just if you need a new server you can't buy a server that was available five years ago so it, yeah we, we try to maintain stability with the results by doing stuff like that so that's booted is the other one did I boot up the other one I did Let's log into one of the agents. Um, so if anybody here is into Python, we'll use poetry. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Poetry? Uh, no, poetry is a, is a, um, a build. What is poetry? Poetry is like a... Yeah, well, it, it basically it helps you manage dependencies and um, it's a wrapper around pip and vm, basically. Yeah, it's a packaging thing. Yeah. Um, uh, poetry shell. We'll do poetry shell. What? Oh, because I'm not in the LNSC directory. Oh, no, I need to be in. Well, yeah, it probably doesn't matter, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Uh, Come on. Well, good luck with never mind on that. All right, whatever, it's fine. I'm doing this anyway. Um, so to run LNST on the agents, we have this tool called LNST Agent. Um, and runs it in debug mode, starts listening on the RPC port. So that's one agent. That's A1. Let's get the other one going. Did somebody just take a picture? Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. I'm playing with my camera one more time. All right, cool. Uh, uh, I turned on the camera I got from the other show. LNST agent dash D. All right, so we have the two agents running here. And then, this ends at uh, 1230, right? We're not going to run that one. We're going to run the one I wrote for this. So this recipe is called Simple Network Recipe. Hey, uh, this, uh, this recipe is called Simple Network Recipe. It basically just, um, it runs uh, a ping and a perf run. And um, it... Uh, it, uh, it will run TCP IPv4 with that offload configuration. Um, I, I guess I can't really, have, I don't have time to get into what offload is, but yeah. And it will just do it. And uh, so let's, uh, let's run it. If you, oh. How do I make this go away? Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, failed to configure address. Why did it fail to configure the address? Hmm. Let's 
That does not happen. Let me go. Wonder why. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I disabled Network Manager on those systems and I rebooted it. I thought that would actually help, but it doesn't. Um, yeah. That shouldn't have happened. Well, uh, let's see. So, yeah, let me see if I can pull up. I don't want to do that on here. Um, um, let me show one other thing. I think I'm done for now. Um, so the way the, if you looked in the recipe, um, you notice that uh, in this example recipe here, we do these things where it's like we create, we have this object and then we have just, we can just create objects on top of that. That is due to some of the ways we do, and, and, and you know, you might run like, so on the controller you'd think like, oh, this is running, um, this is running a function on the controller, but it doesn't. It does it. This basically singles to do an RPC call on the uh, on the host. And um, let me see if I can find where that is. So what you want to do is get through the, uh, uh, the uh, main interface, go to the host. host. You, don't, you don't want the uh, device to handle the uh, pain. You want it to make it all the way to the host. And turn on the test interface, yeah. Yeah, and actually, so, like, this is a common issue when you run into, like, uh, server, um, when you run into, uh, when you run with, like, it's like, you also have to have a network that will talk to these things, so you need to make sure not to touch this stuff, right? So, um, so this is where the RPC happens. Right. Right. So this machine object is what is kind of the high level uh, wrapper around. Um, this is a instance of an object on the controller that is what is used to talk to the instance of the object on the agents. And this is what um, this is, th does the RPC stuff. So I don't, I don't know how familiar people with those RPC. I guess this is kind of just typical RPC stuff, but you know, with this we can, we can, we have also done stuff to, um, where is it? We also have done stuff with set adder to basically allow you to create objects on top of objects and like you can create a bond interface and then when you, you, you assign it and you create it and it will go and run the RPC calls to go and configure that bond interface. But it used to be in this thing but I think we actually moved it and I kind of changed how it works a little bit. So now I'm wondering if I should show this. Well anyway, I'm not going to show that. Um, let's see what else did I want to talk about. Um, so one thing I, I wanted to mention with this is that, uh, so first of all, this, this team that I'm on, it's me in the US and then uh, a bunch of guys in Brno. And the team lead is a guy named Andre, um, I'm not gonna pronounce his last name because I'm gonna screw it up. Um, <laughs> and they're all in Brno in the Czech Republic. Red Hat has a big presence in the Czech Republic. 
Um, so yeah, these guys are like real smart. <laughs> like I'm, I'm really like, I really like this team. Uh, these guys are real cool. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, oh, another thing I wanted to mention too is, is that I don't know. I know there's been a there's been a lot of talk about this, but this this tool actually is a good example of um, creating more inclusive language around tooling. Now, as a network tool, we have to talk about like bond devices and, and stuff like that. Um, but that's not really something we have much control over because that's like other people have to work on that. But in this case, like it used to be that uh, agents were called slaves and we changed that. So we, we I pr when I first started on the team, which would have been in like March of 2020, 2020 I mentioned it and it was like, yeah, we should probably fix that. And <laughs> we had a lot of other stuff we were working on and it kind of fell by the wayside. And uh, Red Hat announced an initiative to do this about a year and a half ago. Yeah, about a year and a half ago. And I picked the right time, like about three weeks before that initiative, I was like, okay guys, we're gonna start working on this. So I went and refactored everything and renamed slave to agent. And uh, yeah, it was great. Um, and uh, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, if anybody has any questions about that, I, I kind of learned a, a bit about the best ways to handle some of that stuff. So if anybody has any questions about that, they can uh, maybe chat with me after or get some tips that they have similar things that they're working on. Um, one tip I will say is that rather than trying to kind of make the user, a lot of times when I've seen stuff like that, like Jenkins did this, where they kind of changed the high level user interface and they changed the strings in the web UI, but like all sorts of core tools still refer to them as slaves. I, my, in my opinion, if you can, you try to make it a very holistic change where it, it, it cause it, it, for both, you know, uh, inclusivity reasons, but also just technical reasons, because it, if you don't do it that way, it creates a whole lot of confusion and a whole lot of like, you know, when you're trying to like write scripts, like when you need to name something, right? It's like, well, this API calls it this thing and this API calls it that thing. And it's like, no, just all call it one thing. And, and it makes it a whole lot easier. So I think my time's almost up. Does anybody have any more questions? Anybody have any questions about Red Hat and networking I can answer? Curious stuff. What LNST? Yeah, um, LNST. It. I mean, it's primarily an internal tool for testing, um, and we're looking at right now trying to figure out what we're going to do, like if there's stuff we can do with with OpenShift and like you know, what does OpenShift call its nodes, like stuff like that. So we're looking at we're looking at it right now. What's that? P push what? LNST? Oh, I forgot to mention that. LNST is on GitLab. Oh, sorry, on GitHub. <laughs> forgot about that. Yes, LNST is an open source project. Uh, some of our tooling that we use, like the stuff I was talking about with the onboarding scripts and like what tests we actually run, that's all internal. Um, some of the tooling we could we probably at some point open source just because it's pretty generic at this point. For a while, it was had a lot of built-in like assumptions about Red Hat infrastructure and stuff like that, so it wasn't easily to open source. But we've recently fixed a lot of that stuff, so we might at some point post a lot of the tooling. But no, um, GitHub LNST.